various ways of doing this, and what I'm going to focus on is either on using history or using projections. Uh, uh, so hopefully uh, by the end of this talk, you will come knowing at least one new way of doing things. Uh, but every method has its own uh, advantages, as you will see. Uh, I will illustrate this with an example of related to global work. Uh, the work is joint work with a series of people, Mark Brown, the Kanan Kushnir, uh, Rabindarat, and Sid, who is a student in our department. Uh, Kushnir, he's a Doherty Earth Laboratory. So, as I said, I am going to illustrate uh, the methods are general methods. They are not necessarily linked to any particular application. But I'm going to illustrate things by using a, a line of dodge question. So, I'm going to introduce the question, uh, which is related to drought in the Southwest and the Mediterranean. Uh, I will. Uh, then I will uh, show you the way that keep some people do these things. Uh, I'll do it in two ways. Uh, show some examples. And then at the end is something that I think is new. Uh, it's a small modification on, on what people do. But in, in certain cases, it has a, a good, big advantage. Okay. So, uh, so the talk shouldn't be beyond anybody's reach. It's just you know, simple mathematics. Okay. okay, so so the idea is we are taking, in order to predict the future climate, scientists uh, have their models and they run them several times, and then they use these projections to describe the uh, future behavior of climate. And one of the key uh, quantities in these uh, projections is a significant threshold or a tipping point, a point of no return. So we, we would be interested in finding out how long will it take for something bad to happen, right? Uh, that sort of uh, question that is very natural. Uh, now, there's a definition of uh, an impact threshold, which is any degree of change that can link the onset of a given Critical physical, physical, social, economic impact to particular uh, climate states. Anyway, so this is coming from geophysics literature. Uh, now, so let's look at the paths. We have n paths. As I said, this is uh, the way people do things, and there's a there's a natural threshold. So, us usually in in the study of global warming, people have a series of paths describing the future, and then they want to know when the, the reality will cross the boundary. So how do people do this? So they want to get at, at, on the on the assumption that these paths have some something to say about reality, that it is mimicking reality. Then what people usually do is they take the average path, and then they look at the time when the path crosses the boundary. This is what I would call the common forecast. So you take the average path and look when it crosses the boundary. And I have been going to talks in geophysics for quite a while, and I came up with this picture a lot, a lot of the time. So now, can you do something better? That's one of the questions. Uh, and indeed, you can do better. Uh, if, for example, you go to statisticians, they'll tell you that this is not the right way of doing things. Uh, so let us just set the, the mind frame. Suppose that these are possible projections of the climate, let's say temperature uh, increasing, and each one of these projections depicts the future. And you believe that each one of these projections is equally likely to be closest to reality. So. Taking the average makes sense. Taking the, the time when the average hits the boundary makes sense. But, uh, well, and here's a picture that shows you that uh, this is implicit, at least in some of the work that people use to understand climate. Uh, you see, in the, the black line corresponds to, uh, so we 
we have temporal or anomalies, such as differences between the actual values and the centers. So, uh, and the long running average. And so you have the observations, then the average models are the red, and the actual simulations are the yellow. So if you wanted to get an idea as to when the anomaly will reach a certain height, then you can just cross and look down. Now this is an interesting picture because on the top is a picture which includes all the anthropogenic forcings, man's man-made uh, uh, problems included. And, and as you can see, well, the, the history is the same, but uh, the models, if you remove hu humans' intervention, the models give you a uh, temperature that is much lower on the average than the, than the one with the human force, okay? So that's one good argument for global warming, I think. Uh, now, can you do better than just taking the average? Well, what the way you, ch you know, the way a statistician would approach this problem, well, not all of them, okay? Because I've shown these two statisticians and they thought the first one was the right one. And then after I present this, you'll see that the second one might not be good either. But at, at any rate, <laughs> these are al alternatives. The other way is take each path and look at it the time when the path crosses the boundary. So we have the first path cross the boundary at this point, that's T1. Second path cross the boundary at this point, that's T2, and so forth. And then you take the average of those. So that's a second estimator. So I, ch I showed you one, which is what I think is a common forecast. This is now what I will say is my new forecast, the average of the times. Okay? Now, uh, Okay. So we now have two different forecasts. Which was which one should you pick? Raise your hand. I, I already biased you a little bit. But raise your hand if you think the first one. I biased a lot. Do I accept <laughs> the word? Raise your hand if you think the second one. Okay. Uh, uh, most of you think it's the second one. Okay. Uh, well, I you can. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so what are the statistical and systematic errors on those it's curves? I can, I can hear you. What are the statistical and systematic errors on those curves? What is the system of what? Systematic what error, what is the statistical error? What is the statistical error and the systematic error on the curves? Oh, okay. Yeah. I am uh, here, you know, you can, <coughs> you can account all those things. I am thinking of very complicated processes in which putting those in might be difficult. I mean, this is for illustrative properties. But if you are interested, let me tell you, the second forecast, regardless of the systematic or whatever errors, regardless, the second forecast, the, the normal forecast, uh, the second one, is better in mean square error regardless to uh, any other estimator that is based on the data. So they are not, <coughs> if you assume that there's something known as mean square error, which means Suppose that one of these paths is reality, okay? Suppose one of the paths is reality. The difference between reality and the others in mean square error, sort of sum of the squares, the sum of the square differences is going to be smaller than if you pick any other estimator with respect to the actual time when the process gets the power. So there is a whole statistical theory that tells you that this is the best. Is the best minimum by unbiased minimum variance unbiased estimator, minimum mean square error, and I can show you that. Yeah. Another dumb question. So Go ahead. The mean curve is that just what's the point wise mean of? Yeah, the you take the average. So that curve might not even be you in the You take the average, the model. right? And then that's the mean path. <laughs> you take averages. That's very it simple, have to be right? Realized. And the other one is you are taking the each point where it hits the boundary each path. So for example, this one hit the boundary here, and so forth, I take the average of those, that's the no new forecast. So the second forecast is the one that statisticians will tell you to use. The first one is that I see more, more commonly used. And it took me a while to 
realize that. But at any rate, uh, so our interest is in determining the best estimate of the threshold crossing time from a range of climate projections. Um, let me see. So I have five more minutes. Ten more minutes. Okay. So now. So, I am, as I said, there, there will be a third method that's at the end, but I'm going to just put these, these methods in context and show you some of the comparisons between them in the example of drought in the southwest and uh, in the Mediterranean. So we're taking data, uh, data to carry out this experiment is uh, from two subtropical regions, the US southwest, and the Mediterranean. Uh, these are calculated from the IPCC fourth assessment model simulation, so the 20th and 21st century. Uh, okay, and you have here the reference to things. Now, this problem was actually studied. The, the drought uh, or the change in climate was started in, studied in a paper by Seeger et al. Uh, in 2007, which appeared in the Journal of Science. So some of the, this data is out there in the science. Uh, and one of the authors is my co-author. So that's how we got, got all of this data. So in this study, we had 19 models that were used to predict the drought uh, uh, the amount of water that was uh, that came up in both the southwest and in the Mediterranean. So there were f 19 models that were used, and uh, these are some of the specifications. The models are forced in the 20th century, which observed time-dependent greenhouse gas concentrations, anthropogenic aerosols, and volcanic aerosols. And then in the future simulations. The models are forced with forcing scenario A1B, middle of the road estimate. Okay. Now, in order to determine the tipping point, you remember we were talking about, so what is the point of no return? In order to determine the, the, the point or the boundary that we want to cross in this experiment, just for the sake of uh, didactic purposes, we picked the, we picked the, <coughs> the boundary to be defined as one standard deviation below the 20 year average rainfall that are sampled annually between 1950 and 2000. So when the rainfall, when the rainfall goes down too much, then we declare uh, drought. Now this, uh, these are the assumptions that we are making. Now that each of the models provides an exchangeable realization of the process under study, and the project spans the range of all possible future scenarios. These these assumptions might seem very stringent. What I'm presenting, everything is about lines. The assumptions are just structures so that you can uh, you can say, well, under these structures I have the result, but. What I present here are just results of our lines. So it's not really married to that completely. Okay, so the next thing is, so we have 19 paths. There, there were 19 paths, and each one had its own <coughs> time of crossing. Let's, just, let's think of them as having equal weights. We are, we're taking the average of the, of the path, of the times, so I'm assuming that they have equal weights. And I'm looking at the time to hit the, the boundary by the I process to be the first time that the process exceeds R, is at or exceeds R. Well, one, uh, one of the things to remark is that in the case of the Southwest, when we were checking uh, the drought conditions in the Southwest, um, three of the 19 models never crossed the boundary. So they never reached what we would be calling the tipping point. And so, in because of that, when calculating this, uh, the average new forecast, we use 16 of them. And at this point, you should say, wait, you said that this was better, but I'm dropping a lot of data, 
right. Well, but my friend said that it was <coughs> uh, these were outliers. So then you say, well, so wait a minute. <laughs> what is happening? So the statistician could be wrong. That is to say, the, 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 uh, the, the, the way to do things is to average the times, but some of the times might be infinite. In which case, when you do that average, uh, you end up with a useless estimator. One alternative is to drop the outliers, okay? But at the, at the end of this talk, I'll show you another method, which is a new method, that allows you to make inferences without having to throw the outliers. Okay, so the next thing is, uh, this is the path of the picture of the American Southwest precipitation models. Uh, and this is the, the threshold. Okay, the threshold is when we go below 0 0.9, 0 0.09. That's when we declare a uh, drop. And you see there are 19 models. Three of them never cross the boundary. And this is the average path. So drought would be declared to exist in the southwest around the year 10, 48, 1040, based on the average path. And the estimator, the new forecast, using the, uh, the average times, get the, t the average of the times, I suppose, the time of the average crossing the boundary, outperforms the traditional estimator in terms of mean square error and Breyer score. Uh, so, under the conditions that I stated, this is this can be proved, and I can show you to you later on. Uh, I can prove this to you. Now, let's look at the at the results. So, in terms of, uh, I had to truncate the three outliers, right? So this is the key new forecast truncated. In the southwest, the new forecast. Uh, truncated give me the date of 2004 for the drought. The common, uh, the common forecast gives me 2018, okay? So the forecast was the drought in the southwest would be starting on 2018. This is using the average path, the time when the average path crosses the boundary. And the other one gives me 20, 2004. And in the case of the Mediterranean, there were no outliers, so we didn't need to drop anything. Now, according to scientific evidence, the transition to a more arid climate in these regions is already underway. So what this means in terms of this picture is that this number is more reasonable because the transition to a more arid climate is already underway. According to the average path forecast, it hasn't started yet, okay? So the truncated value uh, help. Now, n now, as I told you before, what happens if one of the paths never crosses the boundary? Then our estimator, sorry, our estimate will be infinity, right? So what do you do then? Well, there's an alternative between the two uh, ones that I have shown you. And uh, yeah, can I, can I use the blackboard to show you what the alternative is? So the alternative is as follows. So this is the new, the new way that I am proposing. You have, here is the boundary. What you do is, if you have just an, a line crossing the boundary, so this is the boundary B, you look at the first time that the line crosses the boundary and that is your F inverse of B, right? That is your natural estimate. Now, what I am proposing is if you have many lines, well, if you have many lines, the usual approach is to take the average line and look when it crosses the boundary, and that's your estimate. What I am proposing is that rather than doing that, um, because as we saw, it is not optimal with respect to mean square error, 
and it is not unbiased. So it has all the undesirable properties of an estimator. Rather than doing that, what you should do is you take the supremum of each path. So you look at the history. So do you have it? So we have, what we are going to do now is we are going to take the path and we are going to look at the maximum value that the path has reached. That's the supremum. So this is the supremum of Xs super i. So I have, I look at this, the path of the maximum value. I do the same thing for the second one. So I look at the path of the maximum values, and so forth. And I take the average of these supremum paths. So then I will, I will have something like this, the average. I'm taking now an average, but not an average of the original paths, but an average of the supremums. And if you do this, then there's a way of connecting the expected time to hit the boundary. Uh, there are some inequalities. I'll explain to you what this is. If I define, if I take the average, the sum of these, I went from one up to n, one over n. This is what I call a of t. This is a function. It's a function that is determined by taking the average of the supremums. If I look at the inverse of that function, that's what I call a inverse of r. That function, if the expected time is finite, satisfies this condition. The lower bound it always holds, is universal lower bound. There are no assumptions on the lines. It's always true. As long as the processes are non-negative, but you can always shift. So this is a universal inequality. And the upper bound holds under some smoothness conditions. Now, why, uh, let me just uh, say what, uh, summarize what I'm saying. What I am saying is that there's a new way, a new way of extending the concept of boundary crossing of non-random functions to stochastic processes. And the way is by looking at the paths of the supremums and then taking averages. From that you take the inverse. And if we use that, okay, so that is sort of what, this is supposed to be. This is this is the stochastic process. I look at the expected value of the supremum of the process, and I look at the inverse when the process hits the bound. Now, question? Yeah. But if if a path doesn't cross the boundary, its supremum path won't either. Uh, I thought you were taking. But you're taking, but you're taking the average of the supremums. So. Okay. I see. Okay. Instead of using method two, this is method three. Yeah, okay. I'm not using, I am using method three. Okay. Yeah, method one, you take the average of the mm -hmm. paths, and then take the first time the average path of the paths crosses the boundary. That one is suboptimal. The second method is suboptimal if one of them doesn't cross the boundary. Okay. And the third one doesn't have the problem of the first one. Right, so the supremum it's paths are It's similar to the first monotone. one, but it's a little different. Huh? I'm not familiar with the concept of supremum paths. Those are always monotonic. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, no, now, now I see from your picture, I'm just checking. Excuse me? I'm just checking that they had the property of monotonicity. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, go ahead. So if you, would, uh, if you would determine for each exposition the 90% confidence interval, which contains 90% of the models, that would be fairly similar to this in a sense, no? Um, I have to think about your question. Uh, you say 90%? Yeah, so, so assume that there are 10 models, yeah? And for each x uh, position, you can, you can define some kind of interval on the y, which contains the most likely 9 out of the 10, mm -hmm. yeah? So then, then you will get a stripe, mm -hmm. which, would be, which would be crossing the threshold and would determine some interval on the if, if, Yeah, if you're looking for an interval, um, the, the one with the, 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 the second one, second one has the smallest variation possible. OK? 
okay? In, if you're looking at variance, but the variance could be infinite. But you're, you're right, if you were, were to do that, you, you have a, an interval. But if you were asked just for one number, which number would you pick? If you were told, you know, you have to summarize all these numbers, and you, for all these projects, you just have one number, as opposed to the entire distribution. You could put the entire distribution of the stopping time. That is to say, if you just use the second method, and you draw the histogram for the stopping time, that is more information than just one point, and that's more desirable. But if what you want is to give people one number, okay, one number, then that number could be infinite. The average could be infinite, even though the histogram is given. What I'm proposing is that this new number, which is the inverse of the average of the supremum paths, uh, has some desirable properties, uh, including that it is connected to the expected time, and in the data, we, let's just see the results, this is very quick. So for the, the A inverse, using the 19 models, for the Southwest is 2004, and for the Mediterranean is 2008. So the usual estimator is off by a lot. What people usually do is, uh, is nowhere near reality. Uh, you could also use the median of the times. That also gives you something reasonable, but still it's off the, off the ground. And the, uh, the estimator that I'm proposing is doing uh, as good or better than the one with truncation, okay? Uh, one, one more thing, just philosophical thing. So what this method does is extend, extend the concept of boundary crossing of non-random functions uh, that is to say, boundary crossing of just one line to the case of a stochastic process. Because what you're doing is you're looking at the expected value of the supremums. So you're looking like you have a lot of possibilities. You take the average of those supremums, and then you look down. So uh, in the same way that the second method is statistically sound, because it extends boundary crossing of one path to the boundary crossing of several by taking averages, this one uh, extends it in a different direction. I don't know if I was clear about that, but that's the end of the talk. Okay. So I welcome questions. Okay. Any more questions for Victor? <laughs> about uh, yes. met method two, uh, besides it being suboptimal in the sense that you have to throw away some of the data, isn't it also extremely sensitive to, let's say, if you didn't have outliers, but you had something which was not infinite but very large, how do you decide when something is an outlier? And yeah, that's that's a problem. I mean, so my collaborators said those runs look pretty bad, so let's get them out. You know, that was a geophysicist's call, okay? He, that was his decision. but. Uh, we found a way where we don't need to throw away anything, and we still and we still have an estimator that 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 is giving us close to the reality. Yes. I just have a question. Um, have you tried any sample forecast for the is not the reality? It's Oh, well, this method, if that is the case, this is the best method you can use. Okay. So you, you check that mathematically, the right time. Mathematically, the well, the average time, the average time is the best method. You know, the P sub bars, the average of the P's, not the first one, the second method, is the best in terms of mean square error. If you want in L1 error, you use the median of the times. That's the best. You don't need to do data, you just, there's mathematics behind this. But when, when the one, when one of the paths don't cross the boundary, you can always use this one. Because the other, I don't know, I can talk to you more precisely. Okay.